lined up to get their money. If the queue starts in Dallas, who should get their money first? Quarterback Dak Prescott or running back Ezekiel Elliott? A simple truth, an uncomfortable truth. A harsh reality is that the best player, perhaps the most important player, probably the best player at his position, Ezekiel Elliott, is the lowest of priorities. It's Stephen A. Smith show on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 80, and on ESPN News, Will Kane, back from vacation, filling in for the man who is on vacation, filling in for Stephen A. Smith today. You can normally catch me one to three or 3 to 6 Eastern when I'm not here, 1 to 3 Eastern on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 80, and on ESPN News. Ezekiel Elliott, Dak Prescott, Amari Cooper, the Dallas Cowboys have some players to pay. And the man, who's the best of them all, finds himself the lowest on the totem pole. Who should you pay first? Who would you hand out money to first? Dak Prescott or Ezekiel Elliott? Give me a call, 888-729-3776, and I give you Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. The Dallas Cowboys and Ezekiel Elliott seem to be going in opposite directions. The Cowboys don't want to hand out market-setting money. They want to be generous, and reports are that they are willing to give not just Ezekiel Elliott, but Amari Cooper and Dak Prescott top five money for their position in the NFL. Generous is the way Stephen Jones describes their contract offers to those three skill position players. But they don't want to set the market. They do not want to give Ezekiel Elliott Todd Gurley money. They don't want to give him $45 million guaranteed, $15 million a year, according to most reports. They want to move in the direction of Le'Veon Bell, who most recently got about $13 million a year on average. That is not market setting, and it appears to be also... Not enough to get Ezekiel Elliott back with a star on his helmet, back practicing at training camp, at least according to our own ESPN NFL insider, Josina Anderson, who says Zeke might be ready to sit for a long time. Listen. I asked a source close to the situation within the hour. One, did you hear those Dickerson comments? What are your thoughts and is it true? The source said back to me, yes, it is true. Ezekiel Elliott will not play this season if he does not have a new contract. A matter of fact, added that he told the Cowboys this back in January. So then I asked the source, but is it likely, though? I think that's the more apropos question. And he said, no, I don't think it's likely from the standpoint that Jerry Jones, we believe, wants to get this deal done. And he understands that out of Amari Cooper, Dak Prescott, that there's only one player who's actually the top at his position, and that is Ezekiel Elliott. It is Ezekiel Elliott who's the top player at his position. It is Ezekiel Elliott who is the best player among the three Dallas Cowboys skilled position players waiting to get paid. And it is Ezekiel Elliott who is the most important player to the Cowboys' short-term immediate success. But it is also Ezekiel Elliott who is the lowest of priorities. It's Elliott who's low man on the totem pole. It's Prescott that should get paid first. And here's why. Because Ezekiel Elliott has very little leverage. Ezekiel Elliott has very little to hold against the Cowboys. And Ezekiel Elliott is getting awful advice if he thinks sitting out this season is the right way to go about getting paid. Speaking of Le'Veon Bell, he tweeted in response to Zeke's contract demands, they got to pay up, period. And then a set of clapping hands. If Le'Veon Bell is your model, if Le'Veon Bell is your advisor, or if Le'Veon Bell is your cheerleader, you're headed down the wrong path. Don't get advice from Le'Veon Bell. Take lessons from Le'Veon Bell. He, without a doubt, flatly made less money because he held out than had he signed up with the Pittsburgh Steelers on the offer they were making to him at the time. Le'Veon Bell lost money, and that's a fact. That's not an opinion. You know, we find ourselves today in a place where player support, player apologism in the media is so extreme that a player can never do wrong. A player cuts off his nose to spite his face, and you got plenty of people with microphones going, well, I don't know, I kind of think it's a better look. It's stupid. People sitting around going, get your money, Le'Veon, get your money. He got less money. It's like all we want to do is stick it to the man. And sticking it to the man means sticking it to ourselves 
if we have to. Ezekiel Elliott, like Le'Veon Bell, is going to end up losing money if he follows this path. Losing money if he tries to stick it to the man. Don't tell me that Le'Veon Bell avoided injury and got himself to the market. Don't tell me that he wanted to play somewhere else besides Pittsburgh. Don't tell me that Le'Veon Bell had some other motivations than to make as much as possible. And the guarantees he got from the one team in the free agent market, the New York Jets, the guarantee that he got from the one team that would pay him were less than had he gone out and played through the franchise tag and reached free agency. And however bad that decision was by Le'Veon Bell, and no matter how many backslaps and high five and cheerleading and Apologies in the media were given to Le'Veon Bell. Zeke's decision to sit out would only be worse. If it's possible to outflank Le'Veon Bell in bad business decisions, if it's possible to outflank Le'Veon Bell in cutting off your nose to spite your face, Zeke would be doing it. And here's why. Ezekiel Elliott has two years left on his contract. If he doesn't show up to play, he does it in a crude season in the NFL, meaning it further pushes off his free agency. On top of that, the Dallas Cowboys can control him through the franchise tag through two more years. Bell was at least on the verge of free agency. Bell only had to sit one year to reach the supposed pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Ezekiel Elliott is looking at multiple years, where at some point he's going to have to at least play six games. If not this year, then in 2020, he's going to have to start showing up to get accrued seasons, and at the end of all of that, he could possibly be, three years from now, a running back who's played a total of something like 18 games, a running back who's had a history of off-the-field troubles, who's one strike away from a serious punishment in the NFL, if not a banishment. A running back who would be 27, 28 years old, asking to get paid like the best running back in the league. That's what Zeke would be sacrificing those years of prime earning, those years of prime statistical achievement, those years of prime physical ability to stick it to the man. Now, he has some leverage. He's not without leverage. But all he really has is talent and need. Meaning all he really has is telling the Dallas Cowboys, I'm so important to you. I'm so good. I'm so much better than Tony Pollard or Alfred Morris or whoever else you bring in. And make no mistake, he is that much better. And you need me so badly to win the Super Bowl, to compete for the Super Bowl. Your offense is geared around me. And he is that important and the offense is geared around him. But talent and need do not carry the leverage that simply sitting. Sitting by the Dallas Cowboys decision, not yours, does. If Ezekiel Elliott sits out three years, he will be giving away the prime of his career. He does not have one year to give away. He has three years to sit and try to impress upon the Cowboys they need to pay him. Zeke doesn't have it. He doesn't have the leverage. And whoever's giving him this advice is giving him horrendous advice. And that's Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Everything for less, only at Walmart. It's Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. today here on ESPN Radio. Speaking of getting bad advice, the NCAA wants to do something about that. The NCAA wants to try to protect players from bad advice. But before I get to that, let me hit up the phone lines where I want to talk to Rocky in Dallas. What's up, Rocky? You're on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Hey, uh, good afternoon, Will. I want to tell you thank you. You're doing a hell of a job. Uh, first of all, I have to tell you, Will, uh, first and foremost, uh, I think the problem being is not so much even uh, the Cowboys not wanting to pay. I think it's with the other owners and the other collusion that they've had to try to keep the running back 
pay at a certain minimum that it's very important for uh, for Ezekiel to to stay and stand his ground on this one. I, I think once again, I think the salaries for the running backs have to come up. They can't keep uh, a low ball in these these running backs because of the short span of their career. And I also believe that uh, once they look at this. They will pay Ezekiel, hopefully, and they'll do the $75 million and, and give him uh, uh, something to spread out. And I also think if they don't, they can't guarantee that the wide receiver is going to be a forgiven that state because he's young. He'll have offers everywhere. So I think he's here. Him, uh, the wide receiver's representatives are looking at this as well. What do you think? All right, I appreciate the call, man. Um, I think that you are wrong. I don't think there's any collusion. I don't think that there is any kind of conspiracy. I don't think the owners are doing anything to the running back position besides following the incentive, besides following the market, besides making what is right for them. Did you ever watch Seinfeld? There was a fascinating revelation in Seinfeld over time. Of course, you know the show about nothing that dominated television ratings throughout the 90s with Jerry Seinfeld. And... One of the characters on Seinfeld was a guy named Kramer, right? The weird next door neighbor, Kramer, who never seemed to work and always seemed to be around in his apartment. Kramer, no one could figure out what he was, what he was doing, what his motivation was, and how he made a living. Well, as time went on, and the series went on, and seasons went on, it was revealed that Kramer at one time worked at H&H Bagel, which was a bagel shop on the Upper West Side, a longtime institution on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. They went out of business about 10 years ago. But Kramer never really was at H&H, so what was the deal? It turned out that he was on strike at H&H. He was sticking it to the man. He was on strike at H&H through all of those seasons, and you never knew it. Kramer didn't have any leverage to go on strike. There was no collusion or conspiracy against Kramer. He worked at H&H. How much power did he have to actually negotiate for something more? There's nothing being conspired against running backs in the NFL? The NFL owners and the market suggest that that's a replaceable position, that you can get some semblance of the value, some percentage of the value, some replacement level value at a reduced cost. Man, I don't know what profession to pick. I don't know. I mean, you know, I guess... There's a lot of waiters, right? There's a lot of waiters in the world. Nothing against waiters. They do a great job, and they're important to our society, and some of them are better than the others. And if one of the best waiters in the world went on strike because he's like, I must get higher pay, do you really think that he's going to be able to prove there was some kind of conspiracy against him? Do you think his strike or his holdout is going to work to get him higher pay? He may be the best waiter at the restaurant. Hell, he may be the best waiter in the neighborhood. But how much power does he have? Because they're going to replace him. That's what's going on with running back. Not a conspiracy, a market reset for Ezekiel Elliott. That's what's happening. Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. here on ESPN Radio. I asked you, pay Zeke or pay Dak? Which is the highest priority? Robert in Manhattan. What's up, Robert? You're on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Uh, yeah, I absolutely think that the Cowboys should pay Dak Prescott first and even Amari Cooper before Zeke, basically because the running back position is dead in the NFL. And the Cowboys have replaced uh, running backs before. You can even look at DeMarco Murray. Everybody was calling DeMarco Murray the, the workhorse back, an essential part of the Cowboys team. And then the moment he moves on to Philadelphia, his body breaks down. He's not as, um, he doesn't have the worth he had before. So I think the only value of a running back in the NFL is youth and durability. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Super Bowl teams, they typically have one of these two archetypes in their running system. It's either a committee of cheaper running backs or it's one rookie running back, star rookie running back, but on a rookie contract. And I think the Cowboys have to offer one of those two. All right, Robert says pay Dak. And on the other side of the equation, Darius in Chicago says pay Zeke. What's up, Darius? Got to pay Zeke, man. I do understand why Lev Bell is siding with him here. Uh, He was going into the, uh, the franchise tag. He didn't know what was going to happen that current season, so he had to sit out. I understand his case. Um, Zeke here, I thought this league was a what have you dealt with me lately, and he's been the back for them lately. He's been the workforce for them. 
He needs to be rewarded. Brady just got an extension, and his numbers haven't been there the last couple of years. All right, man. Um, unfortunately, I appreciate the call, Darius. I'm going to side with Robert Manhattan over Darius in Chicago. You paid Dak. Talk about what have you done for me lately. Dak Prescott is more underpaid than Zeke Elliott. Zeke Elliott's a better running back than Dak Prescott is a quarterback, and Dak Prescott is a bigger underpaid asset than Zeke Elliott is. But the world doesn't work that way anyway. It doesn't work about what you're deserving of. It doesn't even work really about what have you done for me lately. It works according to leverage. And unfortunately for Ezekiel Elliott, he has so very little. If he's getting advice from somebody out there, an agent, a friend, or Le'Veon Bell, that suggests that he has some kind of leverage to sit out for two, three years to get paid what he thinks he should be paid, he is getting bad advice. And I'm not the only one who sees it. Emmanuel Acho, ESPN's NFL football analyst, said so on Get Up as well. Listen. Ezekiel Elliott will give the Cowboys two more wins than they otherwise would have garnered. They're either going seven and nine without Zeke. With Zeke, you're looking at nine and seven. I just don't know that it's that big a difference. If I'm Jerry Jones, call Zeke's bluff. You saying you're going to sit out all season? All season, RC? I'm not buying it. I'm calling his bluff if I'm Jerry Jones. And in fact... It'll take two to three seasons. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. You can normally catch me 3 to 6 Eastern, all the same television and radio channels. So Zeke could be getting bad advice, and the NCAA is going to try to protect its college basketball players from getting bad advice. According to reports, the NCAA is passing some new rules that certify agents capable of talking to underclassmen who are considering going into the NBA draft. If the player is already well decided that he is going into the NBA draft, he can get an NBA Players Association certified agent and move on about his life. He can hire Rich Paul and move on about his life. But if he's testing the waters and he wants to see what his draft stock may, may be, if he wants to talk to an agent but possibly return to college, he's going to have to get an NCAA certified agent. And in order to do that, the NCAA is going to require something like seven years of address history, three years as certified of being an NBA Players Association agent, and a college degree. College degree is something that Rich Paul, LeBron James agent, the agent who is... Attracting star client after star client in the NBA like Anthony Davis and others doesn't have. Rich Paul does not have a bachelor's degree. He does not have a college degree. And many are calling this the Rich Paul rule. A way for the NCAA to check, to push back on the power that Rich Paul is accumulating in the world of basketball. That's what LeBron James thinks. LeBron James tweeted out, stay woke and attached pictures of many of the new NCAA rules and articles describing Rich Paul. He has called it, in fact, the Rich Paul rule, did LeBron James. Now, I've had some, what I think are fair criticisms of LeBron James and Rich Paul over time, but let me tell you what the NCAA right here is doing is absolute garbage. This is a way to control Players, futures, players, access to information, players hiring who they may want. And it's a way to control who the labor force of agents are out there who can interact with NCAA players. And the NCAA would admit it. They would say so as well. The NCAA would say this is a way to protect players from predatory agents, family members, unqualified friends, whoever it may be that wants to swoop in on somebody's bright future and get a cut. Lead them in bad directions. Give them bad advice. And take a nice 5 to 10% along the way. This is a way to protect players is what the NCAA would tell you. But this is a way to protect themselves. Every single rule that puts limitations, barriers, fences up around labor is designed to protect somebody. And ask yourself who it is. You know, I always find it fascinating. You know, licensing. Licensing is absolutely out of control. Every time you turn around, there's some new profession that requires a license. For those of you who listen to The Will Cain Show and gotten to know me from First Take or other places, know I'm an attorney, which means I've passed some kind of licensing. I took the bar exam in Texas, right? Because they required me to to be a lawyer. 
so I don't give bad advice to other people out there? Hell, I give bad advice to all of you listening all the time, right? Half of you calling would think that. Maybe we should license radio hosts. And not just radio hosts, how about barbers? Barbers need licensing as well because, of course, a bad haircut is one hell of a damage to inflict upon somebody. And I'm not being facetious. There are. Licenses required for beauticians and barbers and anything else. You name a profession and you can find a license. But why do they have to be licensed? Is it to protect you or me? No. It's to protect the existing barbers and beauticians and lawyers. It's a way to protect those already inside the profession from competition, from somebody else coming in, making it harder to get a job. Look, more people doing it means it's harder to get the job. Let's do something, can we? How can we keep these new people from coming in, you know? These whippersnappers, these young people, these go-getters, these upstarts. What can we do? I know. Let's require a new rule, a license, a college degree. Let's require something to keep the competition out. And we'll call it a way to protect the customer. Protect the person that should be making the choice anyway. Protect the player. Now this one... This idea, this rule that the NCAA is putting in, this right here is to protect themselves. It's ugly. Dan Wetzel, Yahoo, wrote a column saying, why didn't this exist in hockey? Why just basketball? This right here is the NCAA getting in the way of itself. You got to let people make mistakes. You got to make, allow people to make bad decisions. A college degree does not protect someone from those who have bad ethics. It doesn't ensure honest advice. It doesn't ensure that something is going to go well. A college degree does not ensure that you get a good agent. It just ensures that the ones that are already certified have a better chance of getting a client. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance, making it easy to bundle your home and car insurance. You can't protect people from bad decisions. You can't protect them from bad advice. And I think Ezekiel Elliott is absolutely getting bad advice. He doesn't have the leverage. He doesn't have the priority. Amari Cooper and Dak Prescott do. Who do you pay first? Who's first in line for the Dallas Cowboys? You pay Dak and then Amari and then the best player among them, Ezekiel Elliott. You can let me know what you think. 888-729-3776. It's Will Kane. Filling in for Stephen A. on ESPN Radio, presented by Progressive Insurance, making it easy to bundle your home and car insurance. There is somebody who says, absolutely, Amari Cooper is more important to Ezekiel, to Dak Prescott than is Ezekiel Elliott. I disagree with that. I think Zeke has the least leverage, but the most importance. Let me debate that guy. Next, on the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Hey, do you have frequent heartburn? Like the kind where you have antacids stashed everywhere in case it pops up. You know what I mean. You keep some in your bag or your desk or your car or your nightstand. You have those chalky tablets ready for whenever and wherever heartburn strikes. Well, listen up. There's an easier way to deal with heartburn. Prilosec OTC. Just one pill a day will last a full 24 hours with zero heartburn. Kick your antacid habit. It's possible with Prilosec OTC. Use as directed for 14 days to treat frequent heartburn. Not... Cowboys have been down this road before. It was a long time ago. Some of you might be old enough to remember. Some of you may not. But back in 1993, Cowboys were getting ready to defend their Super Bowl championship. Remember, they destroyed the Buffalo Bills in the Super Bowl to close out 92, came back with a loaded team again, figured that they would be in position to win, except Emmitt Smith, their all-pro running back, was not part of it to start training camp. He was a holdout. He didn't feel that he was compensated fairly enough for what he was able to give them out on the football field. He held out all through training camp, all through the preseason. He even held out to start the regular season. Missed the first two weeks. Dallas lost the first two games. Jerry Jones decided, you know what? I like winning a heck of a lot more than I like losing. So he decided to open up his checkbook. They gave Emmitt Smith a good big new fat contract. Made him the highest paid running back in the league at the time. Smith comes onto the field. He's a beast. Cowboys win their second straight Super Bowl, and Emmett's a big part of the reason why. Not saying that history is going to repeat itself the same way here for the Cowboys this time around, because there's other things in play. Back then, the Cowboys were already the best team in the sport, hands down, and Emmett Smith can almost be viewed as a missing piece. All right, they were the defending Super Bowl champs. This team is not the defending champs. They won the NFC East last year. 
But I think that they're going to have their work cut out for them with Zeke, without Zeke, just to repeat as division champs. And as I said yesterday, you got to go back 15 years. Last time we had a team repeat as NFC East division champions. Okay, the Eagles did it back in the day. I think it was 03, 04, two straight years. So it's been a while. And Philadelphia is going to be chomping at the bit. Right now, I actually pick Philadelphia to win the East with Zeke or without Zeke for the Dallas Cowboys. A lot of that, of course, is going to ride on Carson Wentz staying healthy for 16 games. But is Zeke Elliott underpaid right now for where he is in the pecking order of running backs in the National Football League? Yeah, maybe you could say that. I mean, after all, the guys won two out of the last three rushing titles. He's one of the best in the sport. He's only making $3.8 million this year. Now, I, uh, again, I hesitate when I say only because there's a lot of people out there that would love to only be making a hair under $4 million bucks a season, me included. And he's slated to make about $9 million next year. Dallas Cowboys running back Ezekiel Elliott will not play without a new contract. A source told ESPN's Josina Anderson. This is different than Le'Veon just not collecting different. checks on the franchise tag where he just didn't sign it. Zeke is under contract, so in theory, you'd be finding a lot of money for this. Does Jerry Jones want to go this season without Zeke Kelly? What kind of fine situation is this? Like, how financially detrimental? I see this absolutely getting done, and I see him being the highest paid running back in the league. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Tom Brady has sold his house in Massachusetts. And totally unrelated to that, absolutely unconnected to that reporting note, I'm just wondering, could you ever picture Tom Brady in another uniform? I can, and I'll explain why coming up in a little bit here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane filling in. You can normally catch me 3 to 6 Eastern on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 80, and on ESPN News. Who's a bigger priority? Who do you pay first, Dak or Zeke? I've laid out for you that I believe Dak Prescott is the biggest priority. If you missed my opening argument as to why, go check it out on demand in the Stephen A. Smith podcast brought to you by the Capital One Quicksilver card. Earning unlimited 1.5% cash back on every purchase, everywhere, what's in your wallet. I think Dak's a bigger priority than Zeke. I think Amari Cooper's a bigger priority than Zeke. But I don't think either of them are necessarily more important to the Cowboys' success than Ezekiel Elliott. But importance and markets, importance and priority, do not necessarily follow. And help sort this out now on the Shell Pinzo Performance Line, I have ESPN Cowboys reporter Todd Archer. What's up, Todd? Well, how are we doing? I'm good, man. Who is, um, if I put this question to you this way, between the wide receiver and the running back, Omari Cooper and Ezekiel Elliott, who do you think is more important to that offense? Who's more important to Dak Prescott and his, and his um, progress as a franchise quarterback? We actually had that question on NFL Nation, uh, asked me for the frequently asked questions on this Zeke holdout, and, and I said Omari Cooper. And because... It's not because Dak's not important, but I've seen Dak struggle with Zeke next to him in the backfield. I've seen him struggle to reach 200 yards passing at the end of 2017, the last two games, and then the the first seven uh, games of of last season. The passing game struggled. When Amari Cooper got here, you know, that passing game turned around and flipped around, and Dak was a much better quarterback because of who he had on the outside. And we can make the argument like, well, they had nothing on the outside before they got Amari Cooper. That might have played an element, but I, I, I think the passing game in Dak Prescott is much greater with Amari Cooper than if they had somebody else with Ezekiel Elliott on the field running the ball. Todd Archer here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane filling in. I disagree with you, Todd. Um, of course, I saw what you saw. I saw that offense open up with Amari Cooper after he came in from Oakland, but the whole thing to me, Todd, seems like it's designed around Ezekiel Elliott. And by the way, not just the play action, not just Ezekiel Elliott running behind the ball behind that that offensive line that they've invested so much in. But what would he catch? 75 balls from Dak last year? It's just they've made Zeke the centerpiece of the offense. Now, don't get me wrong, Todd. I don't think that means you pay him or you cave to his holdout or anything like that. I still think Dak and Amari have more leverage than Zeke does. But as far as importance, I, I got to think they've just geared too much around Zeke to think that somebody else is more important. No, no. Well, I just go with points come out of the passing game. That, that's where you score. It's not 
you know, you, you can run the ball and, and move the ball that way, but you've got to be able to put up points and you do that through the air with, with big plays and, and chunk plays. Um, so I, I don't, I don't mean to mitigate Zeke's importance because absolutely he is the engine of the offense. Can both things be true? Can he, can he be the engine of the offense, but Amari might be a little bit more important. Maybe I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but um, because he is obviously ultra important to what they want to do and how they want to play. But I think we saw the, the entire offense pick up a notch in terms of just scoring points once Amari Cooper got here it, because the passing game was improved. That opened up some stuff for, for Zeke. I don't know if Zeke necessarily opened up things. I, I can't tell you he didn't open up things for Alan Hearns and Tavon Austin and Michael Gallup uh, and, and Terrence Williams last year before, before Cooper got here. But the evidence just says that Cooper was just made such a big impact. But I'm with you. The leverage is on Prescott and, and, and Cooper's side because they're not under contract after 16 more regular season games. And Zeke's under a contract for 32 more games. So that, yeah. that's their leverage point. How does this play out, Todd? I don't. I, as I looked at this, and I laid it out in the opening segment here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, I, I, I don't. Zeke has leverage in that he can convince the team how uniquely talented he is and how much they need him. And I get that; those are real. But as far as tangible leverage, Todd, I don't think he has any because we're talking about not just one year, but multiple, multiple years of control the Cowboys have over Zeke Elliott. So if he really wants to press the issue. Le'Veon Bell only had to sit out one year. Zeke's going to have to compromise right. multiple years to get where he wants. Well, and, and if he sits out this year, his contract tolls, and he's in the same exact situation next August. So right. nothing really changes for him, right? I mean, he's in the, the, the same boat. And, and But I, I'm not a, in a dire mode here of what's going to happen because I think eventually, and I think it will be before they get to the Giants in week one, he will have a contract. He will be the highest paid running back in football in some kind of however they want to measure it, and everything will be forgotten. And we'll, and the focus will be, okay, is he going to run for 100 yards and score two touchdowns this week against the Giants because I need him in my fantasy league. That's what I think we'll be talking about as they get rid of, ready for September 8th. We won't remember what happened on August 7th. I think that's, how, that's just how I feel about it. I think they will get a deal done. So you expect the Cowboys to get a deal done with Zeke Elliott, Todd Archer here, ESPN Dallas Cowboys reporter on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane before week one, and you said the highest paid running back in football. Now, Todd Gurley makes $15 million a year. There's been some suggestion the Cowboys don't want to set the market. He's, what, $45 million guaranteed, which is also top of the market. What is going to be Zeke's... Um, what is going to allow him to become the highest paid running back when I guess the indications are right now, Jerry's like, we're not set in the market. Well, it's, it's 14.375 is the average of the deal. I, I, the, the, I'm, I might be wrong on the numbers and, and the Cowboys are now using Le'Veon Bell at 13.1 and change. They're already above Le'Veon Bell in their offer. Steven Jones has told us that these offers are all within the top five of the highest paid players at their position, and some are even better than that. Well, we can tell you, logic tells you that they're, they're above, they're in the top two with Zeke. So the Cowboys' angst on all of this stuff is, look, if you negotiate with us, our price isn't going to go down. We're only going to go up. And I, I think logic can also tell you that Zeke's people might be way, way, way above that Todd Gurley figure and what they think he should get. And I think that's where the Cowboys get to. We're not setting the market. They'll make him the highest paid running back by a little bit. And if we want to say 14.5, I think they would be maybe move to that number. But if you're talking out, you know, four or five, six million dollars a year more than that, then that's not going to happen. Todd Archer here on the Stephen A. Smith show with Will Kane. I want to get some, um, I want to get a little bit of predictions from you, Todd. Look, Jerry, you're, 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 um, you're pretty laid back about it. You think something's going to get done. But by the way, so is Jerry Jones. It seems like every press conference I see, it's, you know, when have I never gotten a deal done? Or when is this, when have I ever failed to do a deal? Um, so you said Zeke before train before week one of this NFL season, we'll have a new contract with the Dallas Cowboys. Will Dak, when will Dak Prescott have a new deal done from the Dallas Cowboys? I'll say the same time frame. I think he'll have a deal done before they play the Giants in week one. I think the one guy who won't be done would be Amari Cooper. Um, not because of – it just doesn't seem to be the same – the discussions aren't even to the point yet with Amari's people that they are that they have been with Zeke and Dak so far. 
So I, I think you'll see Dak's deal come in as well because it's not like the, these talks. Stephen Jones told us, look, these things can take an hour. If you just put your mind to it and get, done, get right to what you need to get to, these things don't take very long. And, you know, the, the DeMarcus Lawrence contract that was signed in, in April, I believe, that deal came together really within 48 hours. Once Stephen Jones had a conversation with DeMarcus Lawrence, boom, they got the deal done. So that's what kind of needs to stoke this thing to get it going is conversations directly with, with the team to the player, which the agents don't want, obviously. Um, but that can kind of get these things jump started and make it happen quickly. And like I said, for Elliott, I think it'll get done. And I, I firmly believe for Dak, it'll get done too. All right, last question for Todd Archer here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. What's the sacrifice, if any, on the back end, Todd? We talked about all these players for quite some time that have to get paid in Dallas. And these are really simply the first three, actually. After that, you're right. going to talk about Jalen Smith. You're going to talk about Byron Jones. At the end of this sequence of events, at the end of these dominoes, is there one guy that doesn't get paid, two guys, and the Cowboys have to say goodbye to some names? You mentioned one of the guys in Byron Jones. If he has another Pro Bowl-type season, you're talking $16, $17 million on the open market that he could command uh, as a cornerback. So that's one name that it could cost them. And Leal Collins, their right tackle, he's up as well. To me, the, the Collins answer is more about the assets they already have in the offensive line, and I don't know if you can go that heavy with four guys among the highest paid at their positions on in, in one group. It's not so much the money that is or isn't there um, because of the three contracts that are going to work out. And the Jalen Smith one, we can hold off on that one because he's a restricted free agent after this year. So that's, that's, a, that's an issue two years from now. Mm-hmm. All right, Todd Archer, ESPN Cowboys reporter here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Great stuff, Todd. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, yeah, thanks, Will. Appreciate it. Talk to you later. So I asked you, can you picture Tom Brady in another uniform? Before this whole story is done, before you write the last chapter in the Tom Brady book, at least the professional football chapters of the Tom Brady book, can you picture him wearing a uniform other than the New England Patriots? 888-729-3776. I got a couple of teams. Three, in fact. We need to at least consider. When you're hiring, you don't want to waste time sorting through dozens of irrelevant resumes. You want an efficient way to get a short list of qualified candidates, and that's why you need Indeed.com. Post a job in minutes, set up screener questions based on job requirements, then zero in on qualified candidates using an intuitive online dashboard. Discover why 3 million businesses use Indeed for hiring. Post a job today at Indeed.com slash hire. Search for greatness. Search Indeed, it's Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Let me give you the third team. Remember, a lot of the success of Dwayne Wade and those Heat teams, those came at the beginning half of the decade. In the last few years, as he's gotten to be an older player, of course, I think that's why you see him there on the third team. Kobe Bryant makes the third team. And this is where people were up in arms online. How is Kobe only on the third team? Why isn't he higher on this list? Why isn't he at least on the second team? I mean, after all, he's Kobe Bryant. Paul George, Giannis Antetokounmpo, LaMarcus Aldridge round out the third team. Let's start with Kobe for a second. Kobe's an all-time great. Kobe's one of the best to ever do it. But think about this here. It's the all-decade team of the 2010s. Kobe's last championship was in 2010 when the Lakers beat the Boston Celtics. Okay, so then you're talking about an entire decade where the Lakers were not winning championships any longer. Kobe got older. Kobe's play started to diminish. Injuries became a factor. So in this decade, when you're looking at the body of work for Kobe, one title, he was four-time All-NBA, and really only four top-notch caliber seasons to where you would just be completely blown away by. So I think that then it's justified that you're putting them on the third team. I I mean, if you want to put it nicely, you might even be saying that it's generous that they put him on the third team. He's fortunate to even be on the third team. When you look at some of these other guys who didn't even crack the list, and I'll list them for you right now. 
overall body of work. This is what we're supposed to be talking about here for the decade itself, right? Look at a guy like Damian Lillard. Damian Lillard didn't find his way on this list. And I'm just talking about even like third team. Okay, Lillard's played seven years in the league. He's averaging 23 and a half points a game. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. Smith today on ESPN Radio. You can normally catch me 3 to 6 Eastern on all those same television and radio channels. Can you envision Tom Brady in another uniform? On a completely unrelated note, he sold his house, or at least put it on the market. He's listed his home in Massachusetts for $39.5 million. And it just did make me wonder. Again, totally unconnected. Could you ever... Picture Tom Brady in another uniform because I've got three. I got three uniforms that I think we can at least, you know, mull for a second. Well, let me hit up the Shell Pinzo performance line. Stanley in Florida. I asked, who's the bigger priority? Who do you pay first, Dak or Zeke? Who do you say, Stanley? Hey, how's it going? I say you got to start by paying Dak Prescott first on the sole premise. He is your starting quarterback, he only makes $2 million a year. He's proven in the league that he can fit. He doesn't have any off-field issues. Zeke, although he is a more premier talent, you're going to have to wait to pay him. You can't pull a Le'Veon Bell. He doesn't have that leverage like Le'Veon Bell tried to do, although he didn't end up on that team. So I just think he paid Dak Prescott. Totally agree, Stanley. Totally. Thank you. All right, Joe. In L.A., what's up, Joe? You're on the Stephen A. Smith Show with hey, Will, Will Kane. Thanks, thanks for taking my car. Appreciate it. Yeah. Enjoying the show. Real quick, you pay Dak because Dak is the leader of the team and you build around Dak and you can always get, you know, another running back. And, you know, my team, the Saints, we pick Breeze and we build around him. You know, we let Ingram go, okay, whatever, you know. And like with Anthony Davis' uh, situation, he quit on his team before his contract was over. Had last year, had he said, oh, I want to leave, we would have said, okay, we'll help you pack. But he quit. He quit in yep. December, and he lost money. Boogie lost money. We offered Boogie two years, $40 million. I'm telling you, Joe. We advocate for the player over and over. We say get your money. We say cut your nose off to spite your face. We become player apologists to the extent that we end up hurting the player. The Stephen A. Smith Show is coming to you live from above the Heineken River Deck at Pier 17 at South Street Seaport. We keep saying you can do no wrong. We keep saying the player is always right until it's obvious to everybody. that The only person you hurt in this entire situation is yourself. Ezekiel Elliott does not have the leverage. Ezekiel Elliott does not have the power. Ezekiel Elliott cannot be the priority for the Dallas Cowboys. Can you picture Tom Brady in another uniform? I can. Next on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Discover card. Hi, do you have a travel card? We did. Coast. The Stephen A. Smith Show starts right now. Could you ever picture Tom Brady in another uniform? Could you picture him outside of New England? Because I got to be honest, I can. And I'm going to give you three teams. Teams we should at least consider. If Tommy ever leaves New England. This is Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 80, and on ESPN News. Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. You can normally catch me 3 to 6 Eastern. All those same television and radio channels. Coming up in just a moment here on the show, we're going to grab Field Yates, ESPN's NFL insider. We'll run through whether or not Antonio Brown has frostbite, who his top wide receiver and running back rankings are going into this season. And I'm going to run this by him as well. Could you ever picture Tom Brady? in a uniform besides the New England Patriots. Reports are that Tom Brady and Giselle Bungeon have listed their home in Massachusetts for sale at $39.5 million. Now, if this home sells, the closest abode, residence, shack they will have would be somewhere in upstate New York, three hours away from Gillette. Brady has a home in New York City. There's also reports that he's looking in Greenwich, Connecticut, which 
For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Northeast and this corridor that we all live between Bristol, Connecticut and New York City is much closer to New York than it is Boston. It's a bedroom community, a feeder town for fancy pants coming in to work finance in New York City. And also Alpine, New Jersey, another fancy pants zip code just outside the city. So where's Tom going to live going into the 2019 football season if he doesn't have a home closer than three hours away to Gillette Stadium? And can you picture him outside New England? Now, I can. Here's the deal. Tom Brady's made a ton of sacrifices, sacrifices for the team. We all know he takes below market deals and has once again playing this year at $23 million. But it's a deal really that just guarantees his presence in New England for one year. But he's also made sacrifices throughout his career for his own personal life. He said, I want to play till 45 years old. He's made extreme choices when it comes to discipline, diet, exercise, health care. Tom Brady has made it clear that while he is willing to do things for the New England Patriots, he seems to have some individual goals that might extend beyond their cold-blooded interest in him as their franchise quarterback. The long and short of it is when somebody is that dedicated to their craft, when somebody is that dedicated, dedicated to killing actuarial tables, that dedicated to making sure they themselves, they as an individual, are peak performer, you're damn right I can picture him wanting to play beyond his devotion to one uniform, one owner, or one coach. And if I were forced to look outside New England, there are three places that I would at least consider. The least likely has to be the New York Giants. But what is going on, man? He's buying homes all around the tri-state area. I mean... I don't, I don't understand. Greenwich, New York City, Alpine. I mean, what's, why do you need two, potentially three homes in this area? It's not close to where you work or play. So what's the attraction to the city? I mean, I'm just looking here, okay? And I'm not saying that because he's selling his home means he's going to move on from the Patriots. And I'm certainly not saying that he's looking these other places means he's going to play for the Giants. But I'm also saying, I'm not saying he's not. <laughs> Second, the Tennessee Titans. Um, Mike Vrabel, one-time teammate of Tom Brady, it's become somewhat of a second home for New England Patriots. There's always a wild card when somebody moves on. I'm going to tell you right now that Tennessee Titans would not surprise me with Marcus Mariota on his last year, potentially, in Tennessee. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Tom Brady in Tennessee. And finally, we'll see how Hard Knocks plays out. We'll see how Derek Carr's future plays out. But Tom Brady is from the Bay Area, and John Gruden likes veteran quarterbacks. Oakland Raiders, there's three teams. I think at least are worthy of consideration when you talk about Tom Brady outside of New England. Hey, you need seats to a game? Download the Vivid Seats app and enter promo code CHAMPS at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Don't buy any seat. Get a Vivid Seat. Now, let me subject all that to scrutiny, rebuttal, and derision because I heard a laugh there somewhere in the middle of the New York Giants answer. Was that laugh coming from you, Field Yates? That was clear in my throat, Will. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Just finished up lunch like 10 minutes ago, so I had to... It sounded like a guffaw. It, it sounded like a guffaw. A little bit of a guffaw. No, no <laughs> guffaw into your thoughts, Will. Though I will say this. When you said I have three teams that come to mind for Tom Brady as potential after New England locations, I was like, let me see if I can think of one, because I've spent some time thinking about this over the past couple of days. And so far, I have none. Like, and I don't, I, I don't know that I can necessarily get on board with any of the three that you suggested. Come or, on, all three make a ton of sense. Well, at least one of them, well, no, at least from why? real estate. I guess. My, so, okay, real estate aside, uh, right? Like, set that one aside. Okay, Tennessee and Oakland. Tennessee again. So, if I'm Tom Brady and I'm evaluating where I want to potentially finish my career, the allure of Tennessee, like I get it. He has a relationship with Mike Vrabel and John Robinson, the Titans GM. Is it strong enough, though, that you would say to yourself, I want to uproot and go somewhere that, like, my chances of winning a championship on paper decrease, right? Like, I think the division is far stronger. The overall roster is weaker. Like, I, I just don't know that that's, like, if, you know, we have seen, we have talked about players moving cities that might offer them benefit to their career in the post-life, right? I think the obvious one is, you know, LeBron goes to L.A., not just because he wants to play for the Lakers, but he's an entertainment mogul. Los Angeles is the epicenter of that for what he wants to accomplish. Same thing now with KD going to Brooklyn and New York City. But for like Brady, just like moving to Nashville, like up his profile or something, profile or something like that. Um, you know, he is literally any day now opening up a TB12 center 
in the down in the heart of downtown Boston will. Like that's his roots. That's where his brand that's where all of TB12 has been built up. And for Oakland, like, you know, the, is he going to want to go somewhere where they're, you know, they're preparing to move to Vegas in a year anyways? Like I, I just I have a hard time envisioning Tom Brady playing somewhere besides doing that. I understand why people are freaking out about a the way the contract was constructed and b the fact that his house is listed on the market. I don't think that either one of those things forecast that Brady is making plans to be somewhere else next season. Talking to Field Yates, ESPN's NFL insider here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. So let me say a couple of things, but I'm not suggesting that Tom Brady's going to pick any of these locations over New England. I'm also not saying that he's going to end up playing for any of these three. But what I am saying is that if there is a situation where Tom Brady wants to continue to play in the NFL beyond his connection, his commitment, his desire, and more importantly than any of those words I just chose— his desirability to New England, these are three locations that I would choose. See, the thing is, Field, I think you just analyzed Tom Brady as though he was still 27. I think you still analyzed him as though there'd be 32 teams all vying for his services. And the only the only thing he'd have to ask himself is, which one of these places is better than New England? That's not the situation I think that we're in. I think what I am presuming is actually New England walking away from him. Or insulting him with the next offer. Then him going, yeah, Nashville's better than New England. No, no, what I'm talking about is Tom seeing his NFL productivity extending further than the Patriots do. And that wouldn't surprise me at all, Field. How many times have the Patriots made that calculation? How many different players? And how many times have we wondered when they do it to Brady? So what I'm saying is if the Patriots make that kind of choice or make that kind of insulting offer to Tom down the line, then if he wants to keep playing... These are three places that I would at least consider. So I understand the premise better now. The idea that if the Patriots decided it was time to move on, what teams would make sense for Tom Brady in the hypothetical? I can sort of talk myself into some of those teams. You know, the Giants at this point, though, Will, like, you know, you're really going to, like, you just drafted Daniel Jones and took a significant amount of scrutiny for doing so. Like, yeah, and by the way, on the Giants, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but I just can't figure out why he's just trying a real to buy all these houses, sure. houses around well, the area. Granted, as you said, that's a nice place to be. That's a nice place to call home, from what I understand. Right. Um, but back to like the hypothetical teams, it's so hard because right now I'm sitting here saying to myself, like those are teams that might make sense at the beginning of the 2019 season. But as we know, things change so dramatically from one year to the next, right? Not that anybody ever thought he was going to become the NFL's MVP or something, Mm -hmm. but a year ago, the Broncos had found their short-term answer at quarterback, semi-short-term, I should say, with Case Keenum, right? They paid him $36 million. You don't pay someone $36 million. I think it was like 18 guaranteed. Because you have the idea of moving on from them a year from now. So things change dramatically in the NFL, and they do so in a rapid fashion. Um, but I still think, like, I, if I had to, you know, simulate what happens with Tom Brady 100 times going into the year 2020, mm-hmm. I still think, like, the vast, overwhelming, dominant majority come back to Tom Brady playing out another one-year contract that was been reworked with the Patriots for the 2020 season. I agree with that. I 100% agree. If you simulated it 100 times, it ends up with Tom Brady as a New England Patriot. But I also like the point you made about things change so drastically in one year. And one last point on this debate that we're having, when I've had the conversation about Eli Manning's career extending beyond his relationship with the New York Giants, something that people have much less trouble envisioning, one of the places that they mention is the New Orleans Saints. Hmm. Because of what you just said, you What changes in one year in the NFL can be so drastic and unpredictable? And what does Drew Brees do year in and year out? Does he keep coming back? Does he retire? Is he somebody, a veteran quarterback, that could step in in New Orleans? And if that's the case, that could be the same calculation for Tom Brady as well. Man, Will, I got to tell you, like, I, I, I just, I guess I don't see it on Eli or Brady to New Orleans. I think if I'm New Orleans, isn't the option if you don't have Drew Brees next year in house, isn't it Teddy Bridgewater? I don't know. Who you I just, really don't know the you, answer to that. But you just gave him a, you know, you re signed him on a one year deal. I believe it's worth a base value of like 7.25 million bucks for Teddy Bridgewater with the chance to, like, if something happened to Drew Brees and he played really well, get up to a much more significant number. But do you feel really confident that Teddy Bridgewater is the heir apparent to Drew Brees in New Orleans? No, I don't feel really confident. I just would say that, like, I would think two years or, you know, almost two full years in New Orleans of, like, getting acquainted with the system would make the Saints feel more confident in him than, you know, whatever they could potentially see in Eli Manning, who, if he's available at the end of this season, probably means he didn't play well enough to stave off a rookie quarterback. 
All right, ESPN NFL insider Field Yates here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. I want to talk about this story with Field because it's um, it's changing by the hour, apparently. Antonio Brown's had foot problems for quite some time now, and he's really, I think, made Field, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but one practice, one training camp practice for the Oakland Raiders. And he posted a picture of the bottom of his feet on social media, and it's nasty. It's nasty. It's a lot of peeling skin cracked feet, but not just like, you know, it needs some lotion. Like there's some serious medical issues and people have wondered, is it trench foot, you know, which is too much moisture um, on your feet over a long period of time. But now there seems to be some suggestion. No, no, no. It's frostbite. Is that right, Field? That is, that is, yes, that is what, you know, ESPN has confirmed that it's frostbite on his feet that basically took place when he went into one of these basically like freezing cold chambers um, that you use. It's, it's like a you know, muscle recovery thing, and he was in France, and sounds like he forgot to put on what you need to put on to sustain these like legitimately like sub-zero temperatures. The picture you mentioned, Will, is nasty. Uh, <laughs> AB is a, is a heavy share on social media as it is, so not entirely surprised that we got a glimpse of this nasty feat. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it was described to me when he was put on the non-football injury list as minor. Very minor, as a matter of fact. And I know that it may feel less or more than very minor, given that we're now, as you mentioned, some eight practices into training camp, and because they've got cameras everywhere, and because everything will be under the microscope when you're on hard knocks. But Antonio Brown, I still get the sense it's minor, and that you know a week from now or two weeks from now, if he's back there on the practice field, it will be more of like a funny story than it will be a major headline. Talking to Field Yates here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. I want to run through a couple of things with Field. He is, of course, one of our fantasy football experts as well. And I want to talk about his expectations going into this season. But first, let's talk about, Field, your expectations going into this preseason. We're starting here tomorrow night. One of the games is the Los Angeles Chargers against the Arizona Cardinals. And I know this game features one of your most interesting players going into 2019. Yeah, it's got to be Kyler Murray. I mean, I think he, and I'm not trying to be so simplistic in that you take the number one pick in the draft and say that's the most surprising or most notable player going into the year, Will, but think about what precedent he has to set. I mean, drafted in, you know, number one overall, and there had been, I think it was, it was like six, 1962 was the last time a quarterback of his stature was drafted in the first round, but never number one overall. So obviously there's intrigue in terms of him busting the physical mold. Plus, he's one of the most dynamic college football players we have seen in some time. He and Deshaun Watson are the only players to ever throw for 4,000 yards and rush for another 1,000 yards at the Division One level in the history of the sport. He has a chance to be everything that Arizona has been desperate for since Carson Palmer sort of fell off from where he was at the apex of his Cardinals tenure. Uh, Steve Kine, the GM of the Cardinals, had some misses in the draft, as all GMs do, but... You know, no, normally when you draft a quarterback 10th overall one year, he gets traded. It means a reflection of the GM and usually could be job costing. Uh, if Steve Kime nailed it on Kyler Murray, not only will it be lauded for the pick, but it could totally change the uh, sort of the outlook for the NFC West, a division that on paper has three, you know, has two really good teams and potentially a very good one in the 49ers. Kyler Murray, to me, is the most intriguing player by far in the NFL this preseason. I want to save a couple of moments to get Fields' top picks in fantasy and statistical production from the skill position in the NFL. But first, one more question on Kyler Murray. Hey, man, how, how different do you think Arizona's offense is going to look? And when I say different, not from who they were a year ago, but from the NFL as it is. Like, what are Cliff Kingsbury and Kyler Murray going to do that is revolutionary? Is it going to be something that blows our minds? Is it going to be something that looks like college? Or is it going to kind of, you know adhere to pro style pro expectations is it going to be that different you know what i would say will is that it may not be revolutionary and since we haven't seen stuff before but it may be something we haven't seen as much of in a while a lot of 10 personnel one back and four wide receivers on the field with no tight ends which certainly has existed in in all levels of football for quite some time we see it much more in college so to your point yes it has a chance to look much more like Oklahoma's offense than it did than it does the 2018 Cardinals offense which was miserable and barely mm -hmm. watchable and actually not watchable in most weeks but i think you've got a team that clearly has an emphasis on athletic ability and playmakers in space in that regard i think that they the, the foundation of the team has been laid. I have question marks about the offensive line, but if Kyler hits, 
it's going to be able to uh, just mask so right. much of what did not work for the offensive line last year. And while it might have four receivers on the field, what I've read reports are it's going to be very running back dependent, very run heavy. Very David, David Johnson. David Johnson's got a chance to be a fantasy superstar. So there we go. I've got like less than a minute left with okay. you here. So let's just do those three positions. A uh, running back. Everybody has Saquon as their top performer this year. So after Saquon, who do you have? Is it Zeke? And then and then what? If Zeke shows up, it is Zeke, Alvin Kamara, and Christian McCaffrey. You could interchange those guys however you like them. Those are the four best players in fantasy football. Okay, and your most interesting, your top wide receiver this year? Uh, Devontae Adams, three straight years of 10 or more receiving touchdowns, followed by DeAndre Hopkins. Devontae Adams, number receiver. one, above Jones yeah. and Hopkins and Brown. Really? Number one last year until the last week. Yeah, wow. he's awesome. All right, and then finally, quarterback besides Patrick Mahomes. I'll go to Sean Watson, but there is such good depth that you can make a case for Andrew Luck if he's healthy. But Deshaun Watson, to me, feels like the next man up. All right, really good stuff. ESPN's NFL insider, Field Yates, here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Thanks, Field. Thanks, bud. All right, so this contract dispute between the Dallas Cowboys and Ezekiel Elliott and the Los Angeles Chargers and Melvin Gordon is showing something that I've talked about for quite some time. What we're seeing play out in real time is a market correction at the running back position. I'll lay it out for you coming up here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Hey, when you're hiring, you don't want to waste time sorting through dozens of irrelevant resumes. You want an efficient way to get a short list of qualified candidates. That's why you need Indeed.com. Post a job in minutes, set up screener questions based on your job requirements, then zero in on qualified candidates using an intuitive online dashboard. Discover why 3 million businesses use Indeed for hiring. Post a job today at Indeed.com slash hire. Search for greatness. Search for Indeed. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be running backs. Next on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Cowboys have been down this road before. It was a long time ago. Some of you might be old enough to remember. Some of you may not. But back in 1993, Cowboys were getting ready to defend their Super Bowl championship. Remember, they destroyed the Buffalo Bills in the Super Bowl to close out 92, came back with a loaded team again, figured that they would be in position to win, except Emmitt Smith, their all-pro running back, was not part of it to start training camp. He was a holdout. He didn't feel that he was compensated fairly enough for what he was able to give them out on the football field. He held out all through training camp, all through the preseason. He even held out to start the regular season. Missed the first two weeks. Dallas lost the first two games. Jerry Jones decided, you know what? I like winning a heck of a lot more than I like losing. So he decided to open up his checkbook. They gave Emmitt Smith a good, big, new, fat contract. Made him the highest paid running back in the league at the time. Smith comes onto the field. He's a beast. Cowboys win their second straight Super Bowl, and Emmett's a big part of the reason why. Not saying that history is going to repeat itself the same way here for the Cowboys this time around, because there's other things in play. Back then, the Cowboys were already the best team in the sport, hands down, and Emmett Smith can almost be viewed as a missing piece. All right, they were the defending Super Bowl champs. This team is not the defending champs. They won the NFC East last year, but I think that they're going to have their work cut out for them with Zeke, without Zeke just to repeat as division champs. And as I said yesterday, you got to go back 15 years. Last time we had a team repeat as NFC East division champions. Okay, the Eagles did it back in the day. I think it was 03, 04, two straight years. So it's been a while. And Philadelphia is going to be chomping at the bit. Right now, I actually picked Philadelphia to win the East with Zeke or without Zeke for the Dallas Cowboys. A lot of that, of course, is going to ride on Carson Wentz staying healthy for 16 games. But is Zeke Elliott underpaid right now? for where he is in the pecking order of running backs in the National Football League? Yeah, maybe you could say that. I mean, after all, the guy's won two out of the last three rushing titles. He's one of the best in the sport. He's only making $3.8 million this year. Now, I, uh, again, I hesitate when I say only, because there's a lot of people out there that would love to only be making a hair under $4 million bucks a season, me included. And he's slated to make about $9 million next year. done a contract like this before. This is why New England's so smart. They gave Tom Brady an $8 million raise for this season. The focus is this year and what we got to do. That's all that really matters in the end. It was good to come to an agreement with a player, uh, any player, so you know, that's, that's a good thing. You know, Tom's worked hard. He's put in, put in a lot of time, a lot of work, as he always does. He's very well prepared. That's what this team expects me to put everything into it, like I always have. You know, I'm going to go out there and do the best I can this year and, and see what happens. 
The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. An $8 million raise and still underpaid. You think you're all about winning, and then you learn who Tom Brady is. There's all about winning, and then there's Tom Brady levels of all about winning. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. It's brought to you by the new Shell V-Power Nitro Plus Premium Gasoline. Now with four levels of defense against gunk, wear, corrosion, and friction. Let's hit up the Shell Penzo Performance on where I got the dude from Fort Bragg. What's up, dude? What's going on, Will? How you doing? I'm good. I, I know you missed me when you were on vacation because I give you all the Clemson news, but I'm going to tell you where Tom Brady's going to go when he retires. Okay. He's going home, Will, because he knows TL is coming into the league. Here we so go. So he's going to take these next two years, and then he's going to say – the Paul is coming, Will. So hold on, hold on. So when you say he's going home, dude, you're saying he's going to retire? Oh, he's going home. He he sees what me and you see. Trevor Lawrence is coming. He don't want no part of that, Will. So Tom Brady has, he's on notice, essentially, is what you're saying, dude. He's got two years, and then it's off to the rocking chair because it's Trevor Lawrence time? Oh, definitely, Will. We're just two lawyers here talking shop, but yes. <laughs> He knows Trevor is taking over. I know and you know, Will. You're a lawyer, dude? Well, I'm a, I, was, I was what you called a barracks lawyer, Will, when I was in the Army. Oh, right. That's where you helped, uh, what, you, you, you remediated disputes between your fellow soldiers? You were the, the, the peacemaker, the arbiter, the mediator? You were the guy they went to? Well, we can go that. We can say that, Will. We can say that. I'm all things Clemson, Will. And I, I don't just think want so. The world to know. I don't think so, dude. He's coming. I think you're all things Trevor Lawrence. I mean, I don't. I don't even know if your 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 fandom goes beyond the specificity of TL. I don't even know if I'd expand it to the Tigers. I just know that you are the number one Trevor Lawrence fan I've ever met. Number one, dude. And hashtag will. That's my man. That's right. If I can only get the level of fandom that you've given Trevor Lawrence, we're going to the moon, baby. Skyrocket. Skyrocket, dude. Thanks for the call. Let's go to one more. Let's go to uh, Jimmy. What's up, Jimmy in Maryland? You're on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Hey, how you doing? Nice to talk to you, Will. Thank you, man. What's so, up? I wanted to talk about the whole Tom Brady. I, I just don't see him playing anywhere except for with the Patriots. I think that the level of respect that he has for New England and that New England has for him. I know that there's been low-balled contracts from the Patriots in the past, but I just can't see it happening. Look, man, Jimmy, I I'm with you. Like, we're playing probabilities. And I just had Field Yates, ESPN NFL insider here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane, on. He said if you ran the simulation a hundred times, if you rolled the dice, flipped the coin a hundred times, 98, 97, 96 times it's going to come up with – Tom Brady is a New England Patriot. But my point is, you need to at least consider those two or three. And the truth of the matter is, it's probably more than a two or three or four percentage point chance because it's the New England Patriots we're talking about. It's a team that's walked away from overaged quarterbacks, or rather overaged players, over and over again. From Lawyer Malloy to Richard Seymour to Ty Law to Troy Smith to Wes Welker. And on and on. The New England Patriots say goodbye before you can say goodbye to them. You can't break up with them because they broke up with you. You don't get to have upper hand on the Patriots. They're always overhanding you. And why would it be any different with Tom Brady? I understand Tom Brady is not in the same category as a single player I just mentioned. In fact, Tom Brady's not in the same category as any of the other 31 quarterbacks who are playing the game. In fact, Tom Brady's not in the same category as every quarterback who's ever played the game. He's the greatest of all time. But it's still the Patriots. As cold-blooded as it gets, it's still the Patriots who over and over have made the harsh decision. It's still the Patriots, and it's still Tom Brady already over the actuarial tra tables, all over, already flying over the cliff. I just don't think it's that far out 
of the realm of possibility to say that Tom Brady could perceive that his length of usefulness, his career's productivity, exceeds that of which the New England Patriots see it. And if that's the case, we might consider where he goes to play. There's Tom Brady, and there's everybody else. There's sacrifice, and then there's Tom Brady's sacrifice. There's commitment to winning, and then there's Tom Brady. Level commitment to winning. It's Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. You know, I just got back yesterday, in fact, from vacation. Spent the last week and a half in Hawaii, and it was awesome. Aloha. But I was hanging out one night with my family, and I see this guy walk up to me, tall guy, and he's like, Will. And as he walks over, I kind of recognize him, and he introduces himself. And I don't think he'd mind me sharing the fact that it was the new Phoenix Suns head coach, Monty Williams. And Monty Williams and I talked for some time, and it was one of my favorite conversations that I've had, well, with anybody. We went to breakfast, had some coffee, and we talked about what it meant to win. Monty Williams has won at the highest levels. He's made incredible amounts of money. Monty Williams has made sacrifice, and Monty Williams has achieved. And he was talking to me, and he was talking to me about what it means to achieve and what it means to win. And he was telling me, you know, in the end, it's all meaningless unless it comes with relationships. It's all meaningless. It's not, it's not purposeful unless it comes with relationships. He talked about rings and championships and all that matters, but it has to come with something deeper, something more. And in basketball and his experience, whether that was with the Spurs or others, it was the idea of five, 11 men coming together to achieve something, some common goal, some higher purpose, and the relationships that are formed along the way once you got there. If you get there without that, it doesn't quite have the same weight. It's not quite as fulfilling. It has to be both. It has to be championships and relationships. Man, did I think a lot of Monty Williams, and man, will I be rooting for him and the Phoenix Suns to do something this year. But I don't know that that's how. The Patriots see it. I know this, that players who've played for Belichick have a deeper connection to him than you would ever expect. A deeper relationship, sense of his personality. But I also know they're capable of putting all that on the back burner and making the right business decision. Whether or not it's as meaningful to the individuals, I can't tell you, but I can tell you this, they rack up the hardware year after year. Let's go to Will in Virginia. What's up, Will? You're on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Yeah. Hey, there is, there is one legitimate rumor about Brady inside the NFL circles that is, you know, if you think about it, it has a little legitimacy, but it's just a theory. But him and Edelman are from San Mateo area, Northern California. The talk are they want to go home and trade back Garoppolo for Brady. That's the talk according to, to who, Will? Of the 49ers. That's the talk that's according not to just a, That's kind of a legitimate thing I've heard in the circle. I was a coach for 20 years. Coach with Edelman's college coach who recruited him there from Kent State. All right. And that's this. There you go. Oh, but. And I'll give you one more, one more thought on this receiver stuff I've been wanting to get on. You will never win big with a receiver who goes by his initials. Do your homework. <laughs> Dio's the only one that got to a Super Bowl. Wait, 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 Will. As long as you're handing out the uh, the secret codes to to the NFL of players' futures and how you win, what are you talking about? I just want to make sure I got it right. You mean like A B, like Antonio Brown? As long as he goes by A B, that's a problem. O D B, uh, any of them. If they go by an initial, uh-huh. you're not going to win big. Okay, stay away from those guys. Okay, I need to think about that here. So the Browns are in trouble. The Raiders are in trouble. Who else goes by their initials? Julio doesn't. DeAndre Hopkins doesn't. But bad news for Browns and Raiders fans. Thanks for the call, Will. Speaking of that, I was talking to Field Yates a little bit earlier here on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane about Antonio Brown's um, feet. He reportedly has frostbite. He got into a, what do you call it? Is it a cryo cryotherapy, cryotherapy chamber? It's one of those ones where they get in and they freeze it down to really cold temperatures, but it's in short periods of time. Really short. Man, I read this book called Kingdom of Ice a few months ago about these Arctic explorers that, you know, were trying to be the first to get to the North Pole and they sailed up through the Bering Straits and then up above Russia until they're 
ship is impacted, and then they try to hike once, you know, they get stranded, so they try to hike back down to Russia, and, man, they all died. Not all of them, but most of them. Died of frostbite, and it's nasty, but it takes time. It takes time. You know, your skin dies, and turns black, and but it happens like on, again, it happens on your fingertips in exposed areas, your toes, your nose. Did the bottom of your feet in a in a cryotherapy chamber? I don't know. I'm not it just it's fishy, right? Like so he's in a cryotherapy chamber for all of about what? That that goes like like 60 seconds to thir- 3 minutes maybe. It's super cold. I get that that are pointing in, and exposed that I would be more concerned about. The, the frostbite thing's a little, it's in, in so fast in such a short amount of time. I don't know about that. I got some foot troubles on my flight home. You know that? Do you ever, yeah, you ever get the swollen feet on your flight? 12 hours. I told you, coming back from vacation, I'm turning into like, is this maybe, it's uncomfortable too. If feet swell on a plane, that is, I'm like the Hulk, you know? He grows, uh, like your skin's all of a sudden tight. It doesn't feel right. Really more like a grandma. Swollen feet, not like, not like Bruce Banner. It's not right. John in New York. What's up, John? You're on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Hey, how you doing? I'm, you know, um, I wanted to talk besides about my feet, uh, this, right. NCAA, this NCAA ruling. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the power conferences are not going to be hurt by it. So, but, but who does get hurt? is the smaller Division One programs and all the other sports. You know, they're not going to be the, – the Division One pool is going to be cut down tremendously. And all you're going to have is the power conferences in Division One. I. I don't know what they're going to call it, if they're going to move to Division Three, but conferences like the Patriot League and things like that, they're not going to be able to, to afford – to be Division One pro. Wait, I don't know, anymore. John. John, I'm, I'm I'm totally lost on how the new supposed Rich Paul rule makes it harder for smaller schools and smaller conferences. How how does that how's that advantageous to Division One Power Five schools in any way? Well, um, it's because anytime you win, um, you get a point, which which equates to money from the pool of NCA money. So the conferences that don't win and don't have a major sport but play in Division One, like the Patriot League, for example, uh, every now and then Bucknell or somebody else will, will do well in the NCAA tournament and they'll, they'll earn some money uh, from the NCAA. But it's not, it's not on a yearly basis. No. So there are, program, there are conferences that are below that cut line that will no longer be able to afford the – the uh, division one. Here's the thing. Whether Here's the thing, John. Ruling goes through or not, but it, it certainly escalates. I don't know. I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know how that's connected to this Rich Paul rule at all. I'm. I'm uh, thanks for the call. Here, here's what the Rich Paul rule does. It requires that prospective agents that want to deal with college basketball and just college basketball right now, players who are considering going into the NBA draft but not wholly committed, to get an NCAA approved. Agent, An NCAA-approved agent will be one that has three years of NBA Players Association approval, can prove like seven years of, you know, address history, and a college degree, a bachelor's degree. That's the big new barrier that has been placed up, that there will be a requirement for a college degree for a player to discuss his draft status with an agent. Now, the players that already are going to go to the NBA and don't give a damn about coming back, they're not going to be affected. You could hire Rich Paul and be off and running. But if you are in the gray area of not sure where your draft status is going to be, you're going to have to get an agent that satisfies these NCAA requirements. What that does is not, in my estimation, unless somebody else can explain it to me more thoroughly, protect Division I schools from smaller schools. It is not one that protects even the players from predatory agents, predatory family members, predatory friends who want to jump in on a bright future, which is what the NSA would have you believe, but it is one that protects an existing labor pool. Just like any license, just like any permit, just like any barrier to entry, whether or not it's to be a lawyer, a doctor, which is a good place to start with having license and schooling requirements, 
a barber or beautician, which is not a good place, but they exist. Licenses are designed to protect those that are already through the door from those that want to come through the door. To protect the existing labor base from competition. That is what the NCAA is truly protecting. Is they protecting the player? No, it's protecting the agents they already like and that they believe they can work with. That is what it's doing. And that is wrong. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Pick from a range of coverage options with the Name Your Price tool to find a price that works for you. You can't protect people from bad decisions. You can't people protect people from making mistakes. You can only give them the freedom to make their own choices. The Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane filling in. Let me give you the third team because this is what first caught my eye because there was a bunch of outrage when I saw this thing pop up last night on social media about one of the names that landed on this third team. And I think you know where I'm going with this. Third team is Dwayne Wade. Because remember, a lot of the success of Dwayne Wade and those Heat teams, those came at the beginning half of the decade. In the last few years, as he's gotten to be an older player, of course, I think that's why you see him there on the third team. Kobe Bryant makes the third team. And this is where people were up in arms online. How is Kobe only on the third team? Why isn't he higher on this list? Why isn't he at least on the second team? I mean, after all, he's Kobe Bryant. Paul George, Giannis Antetokounmpo, LaMarcus Aldridge round out the third team. Let's start with Kobe for a second. Kobe's an all-time great. Kobe's one of the best to ever do it. But think about this here. It's the all-decade team of the 2010s. Kobe's last championship was in 2010 when the Lakers beat the Boston Celtics. Okay, so then you're talking about an entire decade where the Lakers were not winning championships any longer. Kobe got older. Kobe's play started to diminish. Injuries became a factor. So in this decade, when you're looking at the body of work for Kobe, one title, he was four-time All-NBA, and really only four top-notch caliber seasons to where you would just be completely blown away by. So I think that then it's justified that you're putting him on the third team. I, I mean, if you want to put it nicely, you might even be saying that it's generous that they put him on the third team. He's fortunate to even be on the third team. When you look at some of these other guys who didn't even crack the list, and I'll list them for you right now. Overall body of work. This is what we're supposed to be talking about here for the decade itself, right? Look at a guy like Damian Lillard. Damian Lillard didn't find his way on this list. And I'm just talking about even like third team. Okay, Lillard's played seven years in the league. He's averaging 23 and a half points a game. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Hey, if you missed any of the show today, go check it out on demand in the Stephen A. Smith Podcast, brought to you by the Capital One Quicksilver Card. Earning unlimited 1.5% cash back on every purchase, everywhere, what's in your wallet. It's Will Kane filling in for Stephen A. And on that podcast, you'll hear me lay out why I think Ezekiel Elliott is the most important player to the Dallas Cowboys, but the lowest priority. And if you're going to pay guys, you start with Dak, and then Amari, and then Ezekiel Elliott. It's because Elliott has no leverage, and there's been a market correction with the running back position. Right now, apparently, the Los Angeles Chargers are holding firm at a $10 million offer to Melvin Gordon. That's below Todd Gurley, Le'Veon Bell, and David Johnson. And right now, Ezekiel Elliott's offer is somewhere around Todd Gurley's level of money. The running back market is not. Up, up, and away, inflationary in the way the quarterback position is. The running back market is being corrected by the value of the position more so than the players themselves. Again, you can get my argument laid out for you in the first hour 
of the Stephen A. Smith podcast with Will Kane today. I've also told you the three teams that I believe, if there's a scenario where we can see Tom Brady playing beyond his New England Patriots career, what those three potential teams are. I got a text during the middle of that segment from our ESPN NBA insider, Adrian Wojnarowski, asking, is it the Nets? Is what was telling or asking? The Nets seem to be in on everything. And I have Dave in Buffalo on the Shell Pins Oil Performance Line. What's up, Dave? You're on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Will Kane. Hey, well, uh, how do you sell moving Tom Brady to the fan base in New England? And secondly, when you go to Hawaii, you need to do a layover so you don't get the swollen feet. I'll hang up and listen. Wait, don't hang up. You get those, Dave? Oh, yeah. It's... I got to move around. I tried that, Dave, and I did that. You know, they do the things they say, do your ankle flexion and then lift your knees. Man, I did it all, Dave, and I didn't eat a bunch of salt, and I exercise. I mean, this is like when you go to the doctor and they're like, your cholesterol's high. Eat less sugar and exercise more. And you're like, I do. It's genetic, Doc. I don't even know I what happened you. here. I hear you. I was on a plane for 13 hours, and it was brutal. I felt like a snowman when I got off the plane. <laughs> yes. 